Hello, Writing Life listeners. My name is Vicky, and I'm the Programme Officer at National Centre for Writing, based in Norwich, England's first UNESCO City of Literature. We're super excited to announce the launch of NCW Academy, our brand new home for creative writers at all stages of their writing journey. Whether you're just starting out putting pen to paper, or you're an experienced writer looking to take the next steps in your career, we can offer courses, workshops, mentoring, and a huge library of free resources that will support you to achieve your writing goals. As an added bonus, throughout August, we're running a special discount offer for anyone who books onto one of our online tutored writing courses designed in partnership with the University of East Anglia. While there are many online courses available to you across the world, Ours are unique in offering one-to-one feedback on up to six assignments directly from your course tutor, plus expert resources developed by award-winning writers and industry experts. All you need to do is enter the code ACADEMY10 during checkout. That's all caps, ACADEMY, and then the number 10 during checkout. Visit nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk forward slash academy to find out more and to explore all of the courses and resources on offer. Your writing life starts here with NCW Academy. Welcome to The Writing Life, the podcast for anyone who writes. I'm Steph McKenna from the National Centre for Writing here at Dragon Hall in Norwich, UNESCO City of Literature. It's August 2023 and the NCW team are gearing up for a busy autumn period. We have recently announced new seasons of events, workshops, courses and open days coming up in September and beyond. They feature writers and translators, including Margot Duwehi, Rose Tremaine, Emmy Yagi, Joe Bell, Owen Nichols, Ellie Griffiths and many more. Make sure to visit nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk to browse everything that's on sale. In today's episode, we're bringing you a conversation with debut novelist and creative writing teacher Priscilla Morris on art as resistance and her experience of writing about sensitive topics like war. Priscilla's first novel, Black Butterflies, is the author's personal response to the war that devastated her mother's hometown of Sarajevo, Bosnia, in the former Yugoslavia from 1992 to 1996. It was shortlisted for the Women's Prize for Fiction, the RSL on Duce Prize, the Authors Club Best First Novel Award, the Wilbur Smith Adventure Writing Prize, and the Nota Bene Prize. Priscilla spoke to NCW communications assistant Molly Medhurst about her approach to researching and writing sensitively about the siege and the atrocities of war, drawing from memory and from the recollections of family and friends. She also talks about her desire to centre the importance of community in the book and her narrative approach to time. Priscilla and Molly's conversation contains references to sexual assault, death, violence and the horrors of war linked to the siege of Sarajevo. Please take care when listening. So now I'll hand over to Molly in conversation with Priscilla Morris. Hi Priscilla, welcome to The Writing Life. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much for um, agreeing to appear. I'm very excited to get to chat to you about Black Butterflies and about um, writing about art as resistance, writing about community and writing from family histories as well. Um, And I was wondering if we could start off by talking about um, the inspiration for your book and how it kind of came to life. If you could tell me a little bit about that, that would be great. Absolutely. Um, So... Black Butterflies is set during the siege of Sarajevo in the early 1990s. And my mother is from Sarajevo. My father's English. I grew up in London. Uh, My mother actually left long before the war, but my grandparents were were stuck there and uh, most of my mother's relatives. So I was 19 at the time when uh, the war started. And I remember me and my sisters and my parents watching it unfold on our TV screens each night. And um, eventually my father actually, because we were completely cut off from my grandparents, the, uh, the, the, there was no post, there, were, there was no way of phoning them because the phone lines had been blown up. And so obviously we were extremely worried about them, seeing all these awful images on the news of snipers shooting at people as they crossed the street, um, of flats being shelled. And my father, about 10 months into the siege, decided to take things into his own hands. And he, he went out there and after quite a struggle, rescued my grandparents and brought them back to the UK. And that was kind of the first of a stream of 
refugees, refugee relatives that started passing through our London home um, as they escaped the war and the draft in Bosnia and Serbia. Um, and so that very traumatic time, which was kind of very uh, emotional and upsetting, but also I didn't understand really what was going on, why it was happening, fed into me wanting to write Black Butterflies many years later as a way to, to understand the war that tore apart my mother's country and turned a lot of my relatives into refugees. Um, the actual direct catalyst for it was my great uncle's story. Uh, he was an artist, a landscape painter in Sarajevo, and he lost his life's work. He, his studio was burnt down during the siege. And um, he managed to escape on the last Red Cross convoy out of Sarajevo to his daughter, who lived in England. Um, and he sort of thought he'd never paint again and uh, he was an old man at the time he was 68 and somewhat miraculously after a year of recovery he reconnected with his environment he's a landscape painter with nature around him and he started painting again and he went on for the next two decades of his life painting um, quite prolifically and I was just so inspired by this story this particular story when I heard it that for me, that was a way into writing about Sarajevo, um, this sort of combination of art, war, destruction, hope. Yeah, oh, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and I feel like Zora says at different points that she kind of feels like she was like um, born the day that she knew she wanted to be an artist and just looking at the Goat's Bridge. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk about kind of how her art builds throughout the novel and how you went about writing that as she you know um at the beginning has a studio teachers are and then um towards the end there are some really beautiful scenes where she kind of builds art out of um bits of shrapnel ashes parts of humanitarian aid boxes I was wondering if you talk about that journey and how writing that felt yeah yeah so absolutely so yeah you, you mentioned the protagonist is called Sora and so, whereas at the very beginning of writing this, I interviewed my great uncle and my great aunt and, and various people at length about their experience of the siege, I really, sh and I started writing with the male protagonist, but it just, for me, wasn't coming together and I couldn't, it kept feeling more like memoir, which I didn't want to write. And it was maybe a year and a half into writing it that the character of Zora came to me and she was younger than my great uncle. She was this sort of quite strong, resilient woman. Uh, and with her, it came to life for me, writing it as a novel. Um, and I sort of was able to enter the siege um, with her. And yeah, she, so I was very interested in her as an artist and as you said, she, you know, first there's this moment in the novel that's described when she first realises she wants to be an artist when she's sort of walking by the Goat's Bridge, which is this beautiful Ottoman bridge just outside of Sarajevo. And she has this moment of uh, epiphany, realisation. And since then, it's life falls into place for her. And that's where she wants to go to be an artist. And she, she's a landscape painter. She loves um, uh, the beautiful mountains and forests of Bosnia, which I really wanted to get across to people, actually, because I have a really deep love of the landscape around Bosnia um, from visiting it as a child. And I think, you know, seeing all, very often people just associate Bosnia and Sarajevo, sadly, with war now. And I kind of wanted to get across this, that it's a place of beauty. And uh, I really wanted to get that across. So she, she really gets obsessed with painting the Goat's Bridge in the novel. Um, and for me, these moments of her really connecting with her art, and it's doing a lot of things. On the one hand, it's a way uh, for her to sort of find solace and, uh, and slightly to turn a blind eye to all the violence that's going on around her. 
But there's also this real sort of um, freedom that she's getting and she's separated from her husband at the beginning and she just pours herself into her art. Um, And as you say, later on, uh, she starts, uh, because basically everything runs out, so she has no um, canvas, no paper, no oil paints. And so she starts making art instead with whatever is to hand. So bits of shrapnel, feathers, rubble, whatever she can find. It's basically the, the debris of war. And she's making this into huge abstract um, collages in a way. Uh, that was actually inspired by when I went to Sarajevo to re- research this novel. I spent five months in Sarajevo um, speaking to people about their experience of the siege. I met a fantastic artist called Afan Ramich, um, who had done similar things. He had become, actually, he had had his most prolific period during the war, interestingly, and he had made quite similar um, collages from uh, whatever he could find to hand. I was very inspired by speaking to him, so a bit of his, him has fed into Zora there. Um, and for me, this, it's, you know, it was nice writing these parts of the novel because other parts are naturally very harrowing. There's a whole scene where uh, Una is, sorry, Zora is teaching a little girl called Una how to paint. And it was those sort of scenes that I felt um, very uplifted writing. And so I hope the reader will also find them quite uplifting scenes. Yeah, I definitely, I felt like the reader was always brought on the emotional journey with the characters. I think when they're sort of racked with grief and loss, when they're overcome with love, when they find um, moments of hope and share those moments. I think the reader is always um, there with them so closely. And I think it really, the characters are so well-rounded. I feel like your heart's always there with them. Did you kind of uh, base all of them on people that you'd like spoken to? Or was it a combination of you sort of started writing about some characters and then a kind of cast grew um how did how did they all come to fruition um I a lot of them are based on or inspired by I'd say people I met um so perhaps the only the one the the, the main character that really isn't is Samir the rest I think are mainly based on people but then that's just like they just give the seed of inspiration and then of course it becomes its own character on the page so Zora in fact of course is actually very much from deep within me I'd say um she also so inspired by my great uncle but she did come as a really quite separate fully formed character to me and um, I could really clearly see her in my mind's eye as soon as she arrived when I was in Norwich. And I just remember the moment. Um, and I, I got an image, a, a postcard of what I thought she'd look like, this uh, woman, redheaded woman, and stuck it up on my desk so I could see her. And she, it, I mean, it's an interesting process creating characters. So they may come to start with from people you know but then they sort of take on a life of their own and grow in the very writing of the book they grow and develop and as you you know that they you build up their memories um their interactions with other people their actions and that you know there's the magical moment when they really do start the you know the, the moments when the novel almost starts writing itself and you're like okay this is what they do and you just let them do what they do um and those are really joyous moments. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I wanted to ask, actually, um, how you found sort of fictionalising those stories and um, what drew you to writing a historical fiction um, novel as opposed to, um, as you were saying earlier, writing a memoir or writing down uh, people's um, experiences of the siege. I was wondering, um, yeah what your process was for choosing choosing historical fiction? Um, it's funny because <clears throat> when I started writing it, which it has taken me quite a long time to write this, 13 years in total, I started it whilst doing my MA in creative writing at um, UEA. 
and then continued it through a PhD and then continued it still. So it's taken quite a long time, partly because it's involved so much research, partly because it's a harrowing topic, partly because it's um, very close to the bone to do with my family. It's just quite been quite challenging. Um, but when I started writing it, 20, uh, 10 years ago or so, it was 20 years since the start of the siege. It's now 30, 31 years. And I didn't consider what I was writing as historical fiction then. Um, I was reading books that were historical fiction and that wrote, wrote about sieges, like the Siege of Leningrad, for example. And I didn't quite identify what I was doing with that. Um, I don't know, there's some people have different definitions of historical fiction, and some people say it's, you know, 30, 40, 50 years after the event. Um, it felt, as I was writing it, that it was still quite lived or recent contemporary history you know people I spoke to had different understandings and versions of what happened and even the books I read and documentaries I watched had conflicting facts it's, it feels quite unsettled still um and also I suppose it, it's you know historical fiction I sometimes think of something that's really very much in the past so that you know this this is something that when people read it now they you know there's a generation of people who really remember this of course um but it is historical fiction and I, I'm seeing that now so it's just interesting that I didn't start see it start a, I, I just considered it as literary fiction to be honest when I was writing it um So maybe I didn't approach it in the same way as if I as if I'd seen it as in the genre of historical fiction. Um, why you are you also asked me why I chose it to, to write it as fiction rather than memoir, and the it just wasn't my interest. I just have always wanted you know a bit like Zorus from a very young age to be a writer, and it's always been my interest to write this as fiction um also because for, for me it's what I read the most and what I connect with the most and I think through fiction you mentioned how the characters that you felt very emotionally connected to them and going through their ups and downs and I think fiction really can do this it can really help uh the readers enter and empathise with the characters in a way that sometimes memoir doesn't quite as much. Um, and then, as, of course, there's, you've got the ability to, um, to, well, create a bit of an artwork out of it yourself and to be saying other things and to, to weave in themes um, and to do a bit more with it than perhaps a, a straight memoir. Yeah, I definitely... I definitely agree and I think um it's so interesting and important to share art to share creative works and I feel like that's um a theme that occurs often throughout black butterflies um kind of sharing books sharing artwork sharing uh folk stories um and I was just wondering what you thought about that um, tradition and if you could say a little bit about that in Sarajevo and in your own experiences as well. Yeah, so that was very important for me and I'm glad you picked up on that because, of course, it's not just about Zura with her her art. We've also got Mirsad, who's her neighbour, um, who is a bookstore owner who writes and rewrites the old um, Bosnian folk tales and uh, in winter um when it's freezing all the neighbors gather in Zora's flat around the stove and they listen to Mirsad telling these these folk tales um so for me I guess I was interested in this kind of theme as art in, in the broader sense art storytelling uh, performance music as a form of resistance to war an antidote to the war in that it could um both the making of it could help people process the chaos around them in a way that they perhaps found 
that the radio reports that what you know what people were saying made no sense to them so it was a way of processing things um and also of finding meaning in the chaos but for those that were you know listening to the stories or seeing the art because Zora also puts together a candle at art exhibition um it's a way of uplifting uh connecting people and sort of conferring dignity on people in this situation of a siege which is very long drawn out form of aggression where the aim is to basically well cut off starve isolate but also just wear people down until they give up into submission um art is a way of basically um, fighting against this dehumanization and this degradation and just basically um, uplifting people again. So I really wanted to explore that. Um, and also this actually very much did happen in Sarajevo. I mean, it's really moving, um, and especially in the second year of the siege. Lots of plays, musicals started happening in shelled theatres, art exhibitions were put on. It's kind of amazing the the creativity that did flourish in the second year of the siege, and so I was very interested in this and wanted to to show this and to show how it brought people together and helped them to to get through this terrible period. That's really powerful, and um, I particularly loved as well as um, inclusions of art, kind of Zora's memories of Sarajevo and Zora's thoughts about Sarajevo. She's so I feel like her reverence and her love for this place of um kind of unity in a place where you know she says most um you know a lot of marriages are mixed and it's a real seen as a real like welcoming um area um and I feel like that buoys um the story really beautifully um and I was wondering how you went about writing um you know, writing about the siege and about how things change and, um, you know, the conflicts, the uh, loss of electricity and water, while also um, Zora still holding dear to those memories and um, that sense of uh, love and inclusion in Sarajevo. Yes, the siege itself, I um, researched through, I think, maybe two or three main means. One was to get the sort of daily life, the texture of life under siege. I got a lot from actually living there and talking to people about their experiences of the siege. And they talked to me, not, not at first, I was out there for five months and people took their time, as you can imagine, to open up to me about this harrowing time. And um, it was kind of in the, my last week there when it was winter by that point and minus 10 itself snow on the ground so I was really thinking my god trying to you know I could imagine what it would be would have been like to be there with no heating when it was minus 10 minus 20 outside even and suddenly all of these friends that I'd made started opening up to me and telling me their stories which would take about four or five hours and um I wouldn't write it down at the time because I felt that would be too intrusive. But the next morning I would scribble down everything they told me. So a lot of that sort of provided me an understanding of life, what life is like under siege when you're living without electricity, without eating, with very little food. Um, the facts and the sort of chronology of the siege, which I really wanted to adhere as closely as possible to the actual timeline of the siege, I got from books. And again, there were, I did find conflicting dates and stuff, but you know, I tried to go with what most people were saying. And I compiled a huge timeline of the siege, which I had all around my room at one point. Um, so that was from, from books. Um, and you asked about the memories. So the memories of Sarajevo, some of them are partly my own from when I was a child and visiting, because they are some of my happiest childhood memories and most colourful ones. And so that was a way for me to express my own love for Sarajevo. And then some of them were through re reading and again, through people I spoke to. Everyone that I spoke to 
did express a real love for Sarajevo. Um, it's a very unique city. Um, this, you know, this the the it's had centuries of different ethno nationalities living side by side: Bosnian Muslims, Bosnian Serbs, Bosnian Croats, um, and Jews as well. And peaceably, you know, it was during um, uh, Tito's years, Sarajevo and Bosnia were known for being the least nationalistic and most tolerant of the, the republics of the former Yugoslavia. And so this is what I knew. And my mother's family is a mix of Bosnian Serbs, Bosnian Muslims and Slovenes. And so when it all started falling apart during the war and everyone started taking sides, this as well was very much what I wanted to write about and to show how this did start, the divides did start happening. Um, but also there was this real, Zora is in a, um, lives in a tower block and she becomes very close to her neighbours and they are of all different Ethno nationalities, and I wanted to show how people continued to carry on living side by side and helping each other despite the war. Amazing, wonderful. Um, and I wanted to sort of thinking about um, you writing about people, um, yeah, living side by side, the kind of um, sticking to the chronology of how things happened. I was wondering if you could talk about. Um, the choices that led you to separate it into seasons and mm. um did the relationships kind of grow alongside the seasons changing as you were writing uh the relationships between the characters mm -hmm. yeah um good question i decided i did i decided to separate it into seasons at a quite late point um and it was partly to do because I wanted to show that during the siege, people lost all sense of time, really, and a sense of structure because people weren't going to work um, and or to school, of course. And so you lost a sense of weekends and weekdays and everything started rolling into one and you never knew if you know, one ceasefire would hold and the next day the siege could be over or would it keep going? So I wanted to sort of give this sense of everything running into each other. Um, rather, so rather than divide it into the smaller units of chapters, I felt the larger units of four seasons plus one extra bit at the end, which is called New Year, gave it this more run it, everything running into each other feel. Um, and so I suppose the one marker of time that they would notice is the change of seasons and that it gets very hot in summer and also, you know, and, and very, very cold in winter. And of course, they'd notice it even more because of the lack of electricity and heating. So the elements suddenly become um, much more dangerous and aggressive and uncomfortable. Um, and. The other reason, actually, for dividing it into five parts was that uh, Camus, Albert Camus' The Plague was uh, an influence on structuring this book. And he divides his novel into five parts. And sort of part one ends with the kind of real blockade of the city of Iran um, but because of then it's like a, a bubonic plague. So I similarly sort of structured it. So the end of spring ends when Zora realises she's completely cut off from the world and it's basically the start of the real blockade and there's no escaping for her. So it slightly follows that structure as well in terms of the, the progression and stages of the siege. Um, the relationships developing, um, yes. It's funny because like I structured it also, you know, a while ago and then it kind of go, it's, you know, it takes me some time to think about it, but you're absolutely right. They do um, shift and change with each season or part. 
Um, and so the, the first one in spring, we're kind of really getting to know Zora and a, a, it's starting to develop her relation, her friendship with Mirsad. And in summer, we're really getting to know all the neighbours um, and, you know, you're kind of thrown into the middle of the siege. Um, and so, yeah, it, it is, that is right. Um, and by winter, they really are a very close-knit community, really helping each other. Um, and, of course, Zora and Mirsad's friendship really deepens then, and they actually, uh, for reasons that I won't want, I don't want to give everything away, but they, you know, they become very close at that stage so it certainly does follow the seasons great um and I think I think it's really interesting and really lovely to think about the book as sort of um the seasons running into one another and I think there are just some incredibly beautiful poignant images throughout the um throughout the book with the sort of um the bustle of the bazaar and the um just really harrowing beautiful image of the sort of black butterflies and the ashes raining down and um I know you said that you sort of kept a an image of what you imagined sort of looked like near to you do you think um do you think art and looking at things in a sort of visual form really informed how you wrote and structured the book yes I am a very visual person. Um, I do find just going to art exhibitions it actually makes me want to write often in response. I can quite often sit down in an art exhibition and just start writing. There's something about the kind of elevated state of consciousness that uh, an art exhibition puts you in that just it connects me to things. And so I do write in response to art. And I did have more than just that image. I had about seven different images around um, one of the bridges, the Goat's Bridge, for example, uh, a painting of my great uncles of Sarajevo, a very colorful one. Um, I think I had one at the Vietnitsa, the, the old town hall where the, the library is and where Zora's studio is on my desk. So I did have, uh, many images that just inspire me and get me writing. Um, I also, when I did my uh, research in Sarajevo, I did spend one month working in the National Art Gallery there. I spoke to them and told them my project and they gave me space, a desk in the, the, the sort of library part of it. And that was amazing because then I had access to a lot of the art that was there and also to the um, many, many books they have with, you know, it really gave me uh, a sense of both Bosnian art and Yugoslav art and also of the art that was produced during the siege, which was really interesting. Um, some really interesting um, sculptures were done and some very interesting art was produced during the siege. So that did all feed into um, inspiring me and and my writing I think that com comes across so um so strongly and your writing is just yeah beautifully laced with all of these images and I just um I wondered if you could talk a bit about the title Black Butterflies mm -hmm. and kind of um yeah what that means to you so Black Butterflies um wasn't the original title uh it came to me a bit later on in the writing process um, in fact, it was a reader who pointed it out because I'd written the scene about black butterflies. So black butterflies refers to um, the burnt pages of books that floated over Sarajevo when the um, National Library was shelled and went up in flames. And, and I can't quite remember where I read it, but I did definitely read it that Sarajevans actually started calling them black butterflies. So basically, the whole, it was such an enormous fire, it went on for the, a whole night, at least, if not 24 hours. Um, and the whole of Sarajevo was blackened. The sky was blackened for days afterwards with these burnt pages of books and also with fragments of paintings because three artists had their studios, including really my great uncle, above um, the old town hall. And so it's the ashes of, um, of, books and paintings 
that are floating over Sarajevo that are called black butterflies. And of course, Zora becomes very obsessed with this. She sees them and she can't get it out of her head because it's her burnt paintings. Um, and so for me, this is a very poignant image. And one, it was actually one that I came to me very early on in the writing of the book. Um, one of the first things I wrote and workshopped, in fact, at UEA had this image of the black butterflies. But it wasn't until quite a few years later that a reader said, hmm, that would be a good title. And I was immediately like, yes, <laughs> yes, it would. <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's a great title. And I think it really um, speaks well to your kind of um, marrying different um, feelings and emotions and um, events together. And I, I was really moved by some of the um, more um, harrowing, tragic parts of the book. Um, and I was wondering how you navigated writing. For instance, there's um, a part of the book where um, Zora, you know, day in, day out passes a woman's body um, on the ground um, and her corpse gradually gets um, covered in wildflowers and a sheet laid over her, but she has nowhere to go. And I wanted to ask how you how you found writing those sorts of um parts of the novel it's interesting because it wasn't so much the writing that I found harrowing and depressing it was doing the research and listening to the stories and reading horrific things about for example rape camps and you know really the war was incredibly brutal it was coming back from Sarajevo um, and digesting all that and thinking, what do I do with all this? It was, it was such a weight of war stories. It felt quite indigestible for quite a long time. I got quite depressed and I actually couldn't write for quite a long time. And that it was a, what unblocked me, if you like, was the arrival of Zora as a character. And then suddenly I was like, okay, this is a way into me writing about these things because I can see things through her eyes and she can take me into the siege. And the scene that you're talking about with the dead body, um, I that wasn't, that actually was, just came from inside me. And I just thought, okay, after this particularly severe attack, there are going to be dead bodies on the ground. And I knew that. I knew I'd read that they were often uncleared for days and weeks. And so I just thought, okay, what would it be like if Zora saw one? And so I just wrote that scene and it came quite um, flowingly and quickly because I was really, uh, by that point in the novel, really in Zora's mindset. It was, so yeah, in answer to your question, it was more the initial research and that, that was depressing and harrowing. Um, the actual writing afterwards almost less so I can imagine the weight of that staying with you um and learning about those things would be yeah incredibly difficult um mm -hmm. those discussions with the people that you'd started to come friends with how did you how did those discussions happen it's obviously such a um as you were saying such a recent history and it bleeds mm. into the present um I was just wondering how did those discussions take place and how did, yeah, how did that happen? Yeah. Um, well, it, it, so it depended on the person. Um, with my great aunt and great uncle, uh, so the, with the, the, the painter and his wife, I, you know, obviously asked them, would they be happy for me to write about it? And they said, yes, yeah, very happy. And I think they, you know, they really obviously gave me their full blessing and including when they heard that I was making him into a her if you like they were like he was you know he was an artist he was like yes of course it's your own you know you do with it what you want and that's you know he, he had understood from the beginning that it wasn't a memoir it wasn't a piece of journalism but they gave me about they were very generous with their time and I think I had about five quite long interviews with them which I did actually record with them as some were phone and some were face to face um and but you know because they're family 
then that obviously means there's a level of trust and 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 being able to open up when I went to but they found it difficult they found it difficult to actually talk to me about the siege itself so they could interestingly remember they could talk about the moments leading up to it you know what for them had been the first sign of war and stuff like that and they could talk to me about life in England afterwards and about the the night of the fire but the day-to-day life you know what happened day to day as they were there in Sarajevo for seven, the first seven months? I think either they'd they found it too painful to talk about, or that's like you know they'd blocked it a bit in their memories because that you know as you can imagine they'd left. They wanted to put it behind them, so it was for that for filling in the sort of details of daily life under siege. It was people that I met in Sarajevo who had lived through the entire four years of the war and had stayed on in Sarajevo. And again, a lot of the ones who really opened up to me were either friends of family or people with connections. And these were people that I would spend quite a lot of time with. For example, Una is based on a a, 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 um, real-life person who was eight during the siege. And... She she actually gave me Bosnian lessons, so we had a weekly connection anyway, would meet for Bosnian lessons. And then little by little, she'd just tell me things because she knew I was writing about it, so she wanted to help me. Um, and whereas a couple of other people actually specifically agreed to meet me um, to talk about the siege, and, you know, I didn't really know them, but they said they – you know, I obviously wasn't forcing anyone to talk about anything they didn't want to. But if they wanted to, I guess part of it for them might have been a processing and quite a cathartic thing to do. Um, and, you know, they, they want their experience to be understood. And it was, it was, it was, it was, you know, it was tricky because he, as, you might imagine people were getting very emotional and crying. And there was, yeah, there were times when, you know, what they were telling me, it felt like sometimes it would, it felt quite dangerous, like something that they might not even be telling other people. Um, that it certainly felt like a very raw topic still. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing about that and I think the sense of sharing something very um very personal um and very raw comes across um in your writing and um I think all throughout you can see um Sora and Mirzad and Anto and Milka and all of the sort of um people in this um world sort of fostering community and um sharing in different hardships sharing in um different sources of joy and I loved um I think you mentioned earlier I loved the the parts where Sora teaches Una um to paint and they paint together um and I was wondering if you'd be able to chat a little bit about community in Black Butterflies yes um well, that was definitely one of the things I wanted to write about and how, as I was saying before, Sarajevo was famous for being uh, very multicultural, hospitable, tolerant of difference, people living side by side. Um, and I wanted to show that people continued to do this basically during the war. And so in particular in her tower block where there are Muslims, Serbs and Croats. They all help each other and um, occasionally, of course, there's a slight flaring up of, of, of difference, but basically they're all helping each other and really being resourceful together because this is, you know, it's very isolating being under siege and you've, you're no longer going to work for the most part. Um, and so 
I wanted to show how people really did help each other, um, go and fetch water or uh, cook together. So they just have um, one stove. They make a makeshift stove of sort of um, rags dipped in oil and just two bricks. And there's just one of these stoves between the floors. So they all have to share the stove. They have to, um, you know, they've only got enough food for one meal a day. Um, so they all come together at a certain time and and cook together and talk together. Um, and this is what I heard happened during the siege. And I heard that this new, that there used to be uh, a, a real tradition of neighbourliness in Sarajevo um, many, many decades ago, where people were always going around to each other for coffee and baklava and, and chatting and stuff. But in sort of, you know, in the years leading up to the siege, this had rather disappeared because with modern life, we don't necessarily get to know our neighbours. But I, you know, this is all based on uh, research I did and people I spoke to. They were saying one interesting side effect of the siege was that this old tradition was sort of revived again and people started going around and sort of having, well, it wouldn't have been coffee because they ran out of coffee, but maybe chicory flavoured water with their neighbours and just spending time with each other um during the siege so I really wanted to emphasize emphasize this community that came together during the war amazing yeah I think that um yeah that kind of reminds me of um Sora's sort of like fascination and sort of feeling enraptured um with the bridges and kind of um how that might be at least as I was reading it I felt that like that was symbolic of people mm. kind of coming together um and yes yeah. yeah no absolutely so there's a theme of bridges that goes through the novel as well as you've just picked out and in fact that was the original title for the book the painter of bridges but I think black butterflies is stronger um and so Zora, she kind of, it's her, her thing. She specialises in painting the beautiful Ottoman bridges um, that cross the fast-flowing rivers in Bosnia. You know, there's, there is a bit a section in the book where she discusses this. And she, she says for her, it's actually about form. So she just, she loves the shape of the bridges meeting the reflection in the water. So it forms this sort of round. But she also acknowledges that many people who buy these bridges um, are buying them because they see the sort of symbolism of East meeting West in Bosnia, the symbolism of connection of peoples and different um, cultures. And so, of course, there is that theme threading through it um, that bridges do symbolise the connection of people. So it's kind of the opposite of war in a very basic way. It's something that's connecting people rather than uh, dividing people as war does and so this is what she paints and what she kind of gets obsessed with um its connection lovely I think that's a really nice um note to end on um I just wanted to say thank you so much for um coming and speaking to me yeah it's been such a wonderful insightful conversation so thank you you're very welcome I've enjoyed it very much nice talking to you a big thank you to Priscilla and Molly for their time Black Butterflies is available from all good bookshops and you can find out more about Priscilla's work, including her teaching, at priscillamorris.org. If you have any questions or you want to get in touch, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Writers Centre, we're on Facebook, and you can drop us an email at info at nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk. Don't forget to check out our website, nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk, to find out more about our latest events and programmes. As a UK-registered charity, we rely on the generosity of our supporters to make our work possible. You can make a donation today on the website by going to the Support Us page. Please do subscribe to our podcast and leave us a positive rating and a review because it helps other people to find us. Thanks again, keep writing, and I'll catch you on the next episode.